regarding fertility? Uh, I actually don't know the percentage that uh, get that. Obviously, um, uh, there can be panic in, in once they've made, uh, once they've developed the dysphoria, uh, it can be somewhat of an emergency to get to, to arrest puberty. Um, but that would obviously start often with, with changes occurring. Uh, I don't know the percentage, honestly. Uh, the pediatric aspect, I am often not, I'm not exposed to. Um, but I do counsel these uh, patients, so I, I do see, uh, definitely see adolescents. Um, they're not ready for, uh, often not ready for the fertility discussion in, in my experience. Uh, but yes, they are on long-term uh, suppression. Uh, and then the implications there is once they're ready um, to go through um, uh, the hormone therapies that they would consider uh, some level of fertility preservation. But often the discussion's coming through the parents. Um, but I have engaged uh, a few of these, uh, these kids. Um, and it's actually, for, for me, the most, uh, having kids in that age bracket, uh, the most fascinating part of this. Um, but uh, the, yeah, they're, they're troubled, but the percentage, I'm not sure. And we have someone who'd like to ask a question verbally. Caroline, I'm going to allow you to talk if you would like to unmute. a quick second here. Maybe not. Okay, then I'll just do one more written question. Does the length of time a transgender patient is on their hormone treatments affect their fertility if they decide to pursue fertility treatment years after they have medically transitioned? Uh, well, that would be, um, that would be mostly for the, uh, the trans, um, um, uh, women. So the, the longer, the, the higher the dose of the androgen therapy and the longer uh, the time duration, the, the less likely you're going to get recovery. Um, but um, as I said, it's mostly case series. We don't have a percentage. Uh, it appears to be low. Uh, it just requires time. Um, so obviously the implications there is they're off therapy and, um, and suffering with that um, loss of, uh, of the testosterone effects. Um, but it's, uh, it's based on case series, but the answer is yes, the longer they're on it, the less likely you're going to get recovery. Thank you. If there are additional questions, please drop those into our Q&A box, not the chat, but the box directly, and we can get those answered for you as we continue. All right. So um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. Um, there's so much evolving in uh, trans care and some much needed research happening, which is super exciting. Um, so the next speaker we have is Dr. Paul Yong. Dr. Yong is going to talk to us about endometriosis, diagnosis, and medical management aimed at the community gynecologists and um, family physicians in our audience. Dr. Yang is the research director and gynecologist at BC Women's Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis. Dr. Yang completed an MD PhD in experimental medicine and a residency in obstetrics and gynecology, followed by a clinical fellowship in endometriosis, pelvic pain, and advanced laparoscopy in 2012 at UBC. Dr. Yang teaches undergraduate and graduate courses at UBC. He provides research supervision for undergraduate students, graduate students, residents, clinical fellows, and postdoctoral fellows. And he's the director of the UBC Obstetrics and Gynecology Residency Rotation in Minimally Invasive Surgery. So thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Yong. And I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and share your screen. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay, one second. So thank you so much for uh, having me today. Uh, an honor to be here on behalf of my colleagues at the Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis, uh, Catherine Allaire, Christina Williams, and Mohamed Badawi. <clears throat> so my first objective is to introduce recent advances in the diagnosis of endometriosis. Second, to review the long-term use of oral progestins and the newly available GnRH antagonists for the medical management of endometriosis specific to pain. And then just a final few slides about uh, endometriosis patients that uh, can be shared between the gynecologist and GP in the fertility center, uh, just to encourage some discussion. 
I have no disclosures, including no financial disclosures with respect to the two medications I'll be discussing in the second objective. <clears throat> so endometriosis affects one in 10 uh, reproductive age females. It's defined as lesions which resemble the uterine endometrium present in ectopic locations outside of the uterus, whether in the pelvis or even extra pelvic locations. So you see that this uh, endometrium uh, present outside of the uterus. It's an estrogen dependent disease. It's inflammatory both locally and systemically. And although you have the same histology, there are different uh, anatomic subtypes, which are superficial peritoneal, deep infiltrating and ovarian endometrioma. So superficial peritoneal looks like this classic uh, pigmented lesion shown here in the pouch of Douglas, which is quite different from deep infiltrating. So same histology, but now you have a nodule of deep infiltrating endometriosis that's binding together the uterus, the annexa, and the colon, resulting in pouch of Douglas obliteration. Ovarian endometriomas uh, are chocolate-filled uh, ovarian cysts, uh, which are virtually pathognomonic uh, on ultrasound. Endometriosis is a common cause of pelvic pain, including dysmenorrhea, deep dyspareunia, dyskesia, and chronic pelvic pain, uh, particularly if the latter symptoms are cyclical in nature. It's also associated with subfertility. However, an important point is that there's only a marginal correlation with surgical stage. That is, the symptoms poorly correlate to the amount or the severity of disease. And therefore, the pathophysiology of these symptoms are multifactorial, which we don't have a lot of time to go into today. Uh, but the pathophysiology for pain, for example, goes beyond the lesions and includes uh, the central nervous system. So the first objective is to introduce recent advances in diagnosis. There are four ways to diagnose endometriosis, surgical, histological, surgical only, imaging, and clinical. And they're in order of most accurate, which is surgical histological, but most practical, which would be clinical. Surgical histological is the gold standard. It requires uh, the surgical visualization of the lesions, followed by biopsy and excision of the lesions, which are then sent to the pathologist for histological confirmation. So this is the most accurate, but there are actually some subtle issues. So for example, if a patient has say eight lesions of endometriosis and only one is biopsied and the rest are ablated, and that one biopsy returns negative on histology, but well, we actually don't know if that patient truly has histological endometriosis or not because we, the other sites haven't been biopsied. Similarly, if you have, say, a three centimeter lesion and a few millimeter biopsy is taken and that comes back histologically negative, well, again, we don't know if the rest of the lesion is actually histologically positive or not. So really, this gold standard diagnosis is best if all visible lesions are completely excised. For surgical diagnosis, this is, uh, refers to the visual diagnosis at surgery without histology. And it requires recognition of atypical appearances. So the, the classic appearance is this pigmented lesion, but it also can look whitish or red or vascular in nature. And the positive predictive value for histological confirmation, if you were to biopsy the sites, varies on the appearance. So it, it's higher for the pigmented lesions and lower for these more atypical presentations. So just an example of how this can add complexity, um, if you had a patient where you did laparoscopy and uh, let's say you're only looking for pigmented lesions, but the patient also had these, but they were ignored, then the patient is told you don't have endometriosis, but they actually may do have endometriosis. Or conversely, uh, if you did laparoscopy and the patient had no pigmented lesions, but uh, had these lesions and the patient's told, well, you do have endometriosis, well, they haven't been biopsied because the positive predictive value is you know, maybe 60, 70%. You're actually not completely sure if the patient actually has histological endometriosis or not. So again, there's some complexities uh, to the diagnosis. So move on now to imaging, which is a growing area in the field. So routine pelvic ultrasound has poor sensitivity for endometriosis, except for ovarian endometrioma, which as I mentioned, is virtually pathognomonic on ultrasound. However, a routine ultrasound cannot diagnose deep infiltrating endometriosis or superficial endometriosis. However, there's been a lot of work in the last five to 10 years, which has shown that specialized dynamic endovaginal ultrasound 
can actually diagnose deep infiltrating endometriosis quite well. The problem is this is not widely available, but we do perform it at our center. So three things I'll discuss are the sliding sign for Pouchard Douglas obliteration, the direct visualization of a deep infiltrating nodule and sauna vaginography. And I will mention that there's now some emerging literature that superficial endometriosis can, uh, can be visualized at, at ultrasound, at least some types, uh, but that's still in the research phase. So the sliding sign involves the use of an endovaginal ultrasound with an abdominal hand uh, such that you try to slide the uterus and cervix against the uh, anterior colon. So in a positive sliding sign, the anterior colon glides freely across the posterior cervix and uterus, which indicates there are no adhesions between them and therefore the pouch of Douglas is not obliterated and the patient probably doesn't have deep infiltrating endometriosis. With a negative sliding sign, the anterior colon does not glide freely across the posterior uh, uterus or cervix, which suggests adhesions between them, and therefore the pouch of Douglas is likely obliterated, which is typically due to deep infiltrating endometriosis. This is an example of a positive sliding sign. So you have a axial uterus here, and it's, the fundus is freely mobile against surrounding uh, bowel. This is a positive sliding sign at the cervix. So this is actually the uh, distal sigmoid here, and it's freely sliding against the back of the cervix. So you know there are no adhesions, pouch of Douglas unlikely obliterated, patient probably doesn't have deep endometriosis. This is a negative sliding sign. So here's the uterus up here. This is the distal colon, and you see it's not sliding against the back of the uterus. Uh, this indicates pouch of Douglas obliteration, and in fact, you can directly visualize the nodule of endometriosis, uh, which is here. So um, one can actually visualize the distal colon on endovaginal ultrasound if one knows what they're looking for. So when we really want to get good detail, we actually ask our patients to do a fleet enema ahead of time, which actually uh, helps in the visualization of the colon. So an endovaginal ultrasound, you can see the anterior uh, colon wall, uh, no, the, the, the rectum and the distal sigmoid. You can see the posterior wall and you can see the lumen. So this is the normal anterior wall uh, of the colon. And then in, with the nodule, you get thickening of that anterior wall. So this is deep infiltrating endometriosis. And usually endometriosis invades into the muscle of the colon, but it's actually rare to uh, get into the lumen itself. The third way to diagnose deep endometriosis is, is to use sauna vaginography. So if you do endovaginal ultrasound, this is the cervix here, it's very hard to see the vaginal wall. If you actually take a syringe and place it per vagina and put ultrasound gel in the posterior fornix, it actually lights up the vaginal canal and you can get good visualization of the vaginal wall. So this is an axial view here. This is ultrasound gel that's filling the posterior fornix of the vagina. And this is a nice visualization of the posterior vaginal wall, uh, which is normal. This is a case of deep infiltrating endometriosis, which is called caused thickening of the posterior vaginal wall, um, indicating an uh, invasion uh, of that area. And again, the gel lights up the vaginal canal and allows good visualization uh, of this invasive nodule. Finally, MRI can diagnose deep endometriosis as well. I think this is an area where we need better communication with radiology, perhaps some provincial protocols, uh, but this is a nodule of deep endometriosis that's between uh, the uterus and the colon. Uh, MRI, I think, is more useful uh, for more proximal lesions, such as a more proximal sigmoid, which is not visible in endovaginal ultrasound, uh, because ultrasound can actually uh, detect most distal uh, deep infiltrating endometriosis. So we'll now move on to clinical diagnosis, which is the most practical. So there's been a trend now calling for more clinical diagnosis of endometriosis because we don't want to be operating in every single patient. We're trying to reduce the, uh, the surgical rates. And clinical diagnosis allows patients to have a, a probable diagnosis and then to initiate medical management. So as an, as an example, in this uh, study here, they found that dysmenorrhea was present in 82% of cases of endometriosis and 59% of the general population. Chronic pelvic pain, 80% of cases, 22% of the general population. Problems conceiving, 70% of endometriosis cases, 25% of the 
of the general population. So there's definitely a statistical uh, relationship. So it's useful to, to screen for these symptoms, but of course it's not perfect. So you'll notice immediately that not, not all patients with endometriosis have these symptoms. So 20% don't have chronic pelvic pain, for example. Moreover, some patients without endometriosis will have these symptoms. So 59% of the general population will have some degree of dysmenorrhea. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but it's still important to at least ask these questions on history and, and give, have endometriosis on the differential, and then let patients know if you think, you know, at least that endometriosis is a possibility. On physical ex exam, uh, a key finding is tenderness of the posterior or lateral vaginal fornices with a single digit uh, pelvic, uh, pelvic exam. And so uh, we published before that with a digital exam, the sensitivity is 58% and specificity 39% for surgically confirmed endometriosis. Now, if you use an endovaginal ultrasound probe to actually palpate the vaginal fornices, the sensitivity increases to 81%, although the specificity drops to 22%. So um, there is, can be good sensitivity on palpation for tenderness of these locations, but the reason for the low specificity, the false positives, is that there are other reasons for why these areas can be tender besides endometriosis. So tenderness can be present whether there's superficial or deep infiltrating endometriosis. But with deep infiltrating endometriosis, you can also get nodularity or palpation of thick thickening in the posterior vaginal fornix, which has very good sensitivity and specificity for surgical confirmation. And in rare cases, you can actually visualize these nodules if they're invasive into the vaginal lumen, if you place the speculum underneath the cervix. So you'll see these nodules, some of which will be pigmented. So, you know, this is virtually pathognomonic, but um, you know, this is a rare finding. So it's not gonna help in most patients. So we've gone through uh, four ways of diagnosing endometriosis. Uh, clinical, there's a trend now towards clinical because it's most practical. And so say you've made a clinical diagnosis, how do you manage these patients? So I'd like to talk about the use of progestins and the now available GnRH antagonists. This is the algorithm from the SOGC 2010, which is currently being revised. So if you have a patient uh, with suspected endometriosis, the first line therapy are combined hormonal uh, contraceptives or CHCs. If they don't work, then it's laparoscopy or other medical therapy, whether oral progestins, GnRH agonists, or now GnRH antagonists, uh, progestin IUS, and then if these don't work, uh, referral to uh, multidisciplinary support, such as at our center. These hormonal therapies work in several ways. They suppress systemic uh, estradiol uh, by suppressing ovulation, but endometriosis actually has its own local production of estradiol, and these hormonal therapies also suppress this local production. And in fact, uh, these hormonal therapies have also been found to have anti-inflammatory effects uh, on endometriosis. So a few comments about the first-line therapy. So most patients will respond to CHCs and do well, but when you actually delve into the data, it's interesting. So in a systematic review, there are only two placebo-controlled RCTs for the CHC. And they do improve dysmenorrhea and the worst reported pain, but there's actually no difference with placebo when it comes to chronic non-menstrual pelvic pain. There's also a paper that was published that suggested that past CHC use could be a risk factor for future diagnosis of deep endometriosis, although we published last year that, uh, that we actually did, did not find this. But the concern is that CHCs contain ethanol estradiol, and because endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent disease, that ethanol estradiol may feed into the lesion. Regardless, um, we've all seen patients who've tried multiple CHCs without benefit. So in this study, they found that 28% of patients with endometriosis had tried two CHCs, 28% had tried three to five, 15% had tried six to 10. In a study we did of 373 patients with endometriosis, we found that a quarter of patients said that cyclic CHCs were not effective for their endometriosis-associated pain, and another quarter said they couldn't tolerate the side effects and they had to discontinue uh, the CHC. So while CHCs work for many patients, we have good data on long-term safety. There's clearly a subset of patients uh, who are not responders or who struggle with side effects. So this brings us to the use of long-term progestins. 
So these progestins, though, know, you can start them. The patient can do well on them initially. But what I wanted to talk about today was long-term use and what are the issues. The first is Dianagest, which is two milligrams once a day. When you actually look at these ovulation inhibition studies, they're actually kind of scary because the sample sizes are so low, but technically two milligrams is the ovulation inhibition dose. But you know, with a larger sample, you know, I think you're bound to find some patients uh, who are not well suppressed on this dosage and who may need a higher dose, but the standard is two milligrams. So what if you use Diana just for one year? Well, first of all, there's an ongoing reduction in pain. So pain doesn't start to rebound at six months. So that is reassuring. However, at one year, you start to see variable control of bleeding. So only about 20% are still amenorrheic. About the similar proportion have spotting and about 40% actually have light menses. So important to counsel patients that they're unlikely to be completely amenorrheic for the full year. For weight gain, uh, the blue here is Diana Just. So at about uh, 24 weeks of therapy, there's an on average a two kilogram weight gain, uh, although you can see there's quite a bit of variability. But the reassuring point is that at a year, there's no cumulative uh, weight gain on average. So it's, it actually plateaus out. So uh, that is you know, something that can be told to patients with counseling. Lipids, no effect on lipids. And you know, now we're interested in liver enzymes, no impact on liver enzymes at one year. I'd like to talk more about bone mineral density. So this study found that from baseline to 24 weeks, there's an on average a 1.6% decrease in lumbar bone mineral density uh, on Dianagest. However, again, reassuring that from 24 to 52 weeks, the change is only 0.2%. So there doesn't appear to be this ongoing cumulative loss and appears to plateau similar uh, to weight gain. And if you actually take Diana just for five years, um, the significant BMD bone loss, which was defined as 4% in this study, occurred in 5% of the population or one in 20 patients. So it can occur at five years, but the majority are actually okay. In adolescence, there's a need for uh, caution uh, because in uh, at least one study, there was some bone loss after the end of therapy with Diana Just, and six months after stopping Diana Just, they still had not gotten back to their baseline bone mineral density. So Diana Just in the long term, what to do? You know, there aren't any big studies uh, in this area as far as I know, but I recommend calcium, vitamin D, and exercise. Consider BMD testing on a case-by-case -case basis, perhaps by osteoporosis risk factors or by duration of therapy, as say if they approach five years. Keeping in mind, this is a young, gen generally a younger, healthy population, so the absolute fracture risk is probably quite low. There is a need for caution in adolescence. Uh, but say you have a patient where BMD is a concern, uh, is there an alternative progestin? And there is, which is norethindrone acetate or NEDA. So the standard dosage is five milligrams once a day. It could be titrated lower. So 2.5 milligrams is a common dose in Europe, or it can be titrated higher to 10 to 15 milligrams. Again, the ovulation inhibition studies are a little scary, you know, it's sample sizes of one or two. Um, but you, you're also, I think, with a large enough sample, you're gonna see some variability where some patients were, would be well suppressed on 2.5 milligrams, others uh, will need up to 10, 15 milligrams. So the good thing about NEDA is that it's partially estrogenic. So it has less hypoestrogenic side effects, such as for bone. According to these two reviews, it can partially bind estrogen receptors and it's partially converted by aromatase to estradiol. And in fact, uh, for patients on a GnRH agonist, it's used by itself as a form of HRT to protect bone. So if you have, have a patient with endometriosis who's on NEDA long-term, at least theoretically, uh, bone should be okay. The problem with NEDA is it's more androgenic than Dianagest, so there's a potential impact on lipids. And in fact, in this study, they did find a subtle impact. So they found a reduction in HDL, an increase in LDL, but a reduction in triglycerides. So you know, what this means in terms of long-term cardiovascular risk is unknown, but it's something to, to keep in mind uh, when counseling patients. 
So those are some issues with long-term use of progestins. And I'd like to now talk about GnRH antagonists, which is the, the, most, uh, the newest therapy for medical management of endometriosis. GnRH antagonists can be injectable or oral, and oral antagonists have the advantage of a dose-dependent estrogen reduction, which allows for suppression of disease, but you try to limit the hypoestrogenic side effects. It allows for avoidance of a flare and the rapid onset and rapid restarting of HPO function. So with a depot GnRH agonist, such as luprolide, uh, you can get this flare initially of estradiol, but eventually estradiol drops, and then it stays below this hypoestrogenic uh, cutoff, so you can get uh, quite a bit of hypoestrogenic side effects. With GnRH antagonists, you get rapid onset of, of treatment, this drop in estradiol, uh, but you, you can keep the estradiol levels you know, above that hyperestrogenic cutoff. So it's enough reduction in estradiol that it's therapeutic, but not too much uh, that the patient has uh, side effects or too many side effects. So elagolitz is now available in Canada after the publication of this trial a few, uh, few years ago. It is an oral non-peptide GnRH antagonist. The standard dose is 150 milligrams daily. Uh, the higher dose is 400 milligrams or 200 milligrams twice a day. The immediate thing you'll notice, very interesting with this drug, is a significant rate of ovulation. So you can see that many patients do not have ovulation inhibited, actually. And the estradiol levels are in kind of the early follicular phase for the lower dose and then getting closer to the menopausal cutoff uh, for the higher dose. So this uh, New England Journal paper included two phase three trials. And um, because ovulation is kind of variable in terms of inhibition, as you'd expect, the amenorrhea rates vary. So at the 150 dose, the amenorrhea rate is 15 to 30%. At the 400 milligram dose, it is a little bit higher. But if you have a patient where you really want amenorrhea, this may not be the first line drug you'll use. Now, even though many patients are having menses, the primary benefit of this drug is for dysmenorrhea, so the menses are less painful. The green here is placebo, the purple is at 150, the blue is 400, and you can see a significant increase in a clinical response for dysmenorrhea on the drug compared to the placebo. There's also a statistically uh, significant uh, response for non-menstrual chronic pelvic pain, but the absolute magnitude is not as good as for dysmenorrhea. For dysmenorrhea, the uh, onset or the, uh, um, the maximal benefit for pain you get at around two months of therapy, but for non-menstrual chronic pelvic pain, uh, not only is the benefit smaller, but the benefit is delayed. So it takes up to four months to get the maximal benefit for pain. So if this is the symptom that the patient's mostly complaining about, uh, you need to tell them it may take you know, at least three, four months uh, before uh, maximal benefit is noted. Hot flushes are variable on this drug. So at the lower dose, 24% had hot flushes, most of which were mild. At the 400 milligram dosage, 40% had hot flushes, most of which were mild to moderate. And very few patients discontinued the medication due to the hot flushes. One issue with this drug is they actually found increased LDL cholesterol. So not sure whether this affects cardiovascular risk, but this is something that probably needs to be investigated more uh, in the future. The other issue with the drug is bone mineral density. So green here is placebo, purple is 150, blue is 400. So there's a small decrease in bone mineral density at the 150, but a more significant decrease at the 400 milligram dosage. And then in longer term studies, there were other issues with the 400 milligram dosage. So these are Z scores. The orange is 150. This is baseline. There's a slight decrease after 12 months of therapy at 150 milligrams. And after you stop the drug, uh, you get a slight improvement again um, in the Z score and it basically goes back uh, close to or at normal. At 400 milligrams, you get a significant decrease at one year. And after you stop the drug at six months and 12 months after, you actually don't get back to your baseline. So um, there's only partial recovery of bone mineral density uh, after the 400 milligram dosage. 
So um, the other issue with the Lagalix is that, you know, if patients are ovulating, well, you know, they can actually get pregnant. So a few patients got pregnant in these two phase three trials. So six in the first one and two in the other. And uh, the next slide comes from AbbVie, the company. Uh, I guess this is unpublished data, but uh, as of 2018, there were 49 pregnancies on Alagalix. Of, uh, of these 49, there were two congenital malformations, five cases of spontaneous abortion, and it appeared that birth weights were okay. Um, so more data is needed to know about safety, but at this time, Alagalix is contraindicated, obviously in patients who are pregnant, but in those who are actively trying to become pregnant. This raises the importance of family planning. So the recommendation is for non-hormonal or progestin only uh, contraception. The reason is that there's this thought of an interaction between the CHC and Elagalix. Uh, CHC might affect Elagalix activity and uh, there might be subtle changes on CHC activity um, according to this review article. So uh, right now the recommendation is non-hormonal or progestin only. So GnRH antagonists, what to do? So is this something we consider after progestins or could it be an alternative to oral progestins? Uh, important to have a family planning discussion with patients if one is gonna start this medication. And right now, a bit of uncertainty about cardiovascular effects of uh, lipid changes. For bone mineral density at the 150 milligram dosage, after 12 months, right now, it's been suggested to me to check uh, bone mineral density. It's not that there's a study showing that after 12 months of um, elagalix, all of a sudden the BMD decreases. It's just that there's data only up to 12 months. So it's not, the long term is not clear. Uh, and so it's been suggested to check uh, BMD at that point. For the 400 milligram dosage, it's limited to six months due to BMD loss, but there are trials now in progress uh, for HRT taken at the same time, and perhaps uh, the 400 milligram dosage uh, can be taken longer in these circumstances. So I'd like to add just with a few slides to discuss some issues for endometriosis versus patients that may be shared between a gynecologist or GP and the fertility center. So, Let's say you have a patient who you've diagnosed with endometriosis. Let's say it's a, a clinical diagnosis or an imaging diagnosis. They've been on hormonal therapy. Let's say it's uh, Elagalix or um, Dianagest, uh, but now they would like to conceive. So the first scenario is, let's say it's a 30-year-old with a four centimeter ovarian endometrioma. Uh, hormonal therapy worked very well for pain, but they had to stop it due to side effects. And they're not planning to try for, for a couple of years, so maybe two years. And this is not that uncommon, I, I see at least in, in my practice. The patient's interested in their uh, future fertility. You do an antrophallical count, it seems low. They request an AMH, it, it seems to be low. And you know, I, it, it's a struggle to know when do we refer these patients to a fertility center? You know, not planning to try for a couple of years. Should we refer them now if there's concern about ovarian reserve? Or you know, is, is that a wasted referral? I, know, I don't know. Are, are these uh, patients who could be candidates for oocyte cryopreservation? Um, uh, you know, I, it, it's, I think some uncertainty. The second scenario, let's say it's a 35 year old with a four centimeter endometrioma. They've gone off of hormonal therapy and they want to get pregnant ASAP. And then same thing, you do an ultrasound, decrease AFC, they request an AMH, it's decreased. And I know it depends on what the actual values are, but um, you know, how long do you let a patient like this uh, try for? Um, is it important to refer them sooner rather than later so they can get counseling about uh, you know, what are their, their chances of a natural conception uh, or uh, whether they should be using ART sooner, or, uh, sooner rather than later? So another thing that I, I struggle with in practice. And the third scenario, and this is the classic issue, you know, say it's a 37 year old with six centimeter endometrioma to undergo IVF, uh, you know, when to operate in these patients other than the indication of pain. And we've wondered at our center, you know, what we tell patients about surgery in this circumstance, is it the same as what uh, fertility specialists are telling uh, patients? Uh, could there be an opportunity for shared protocols for counseling to ensure the information is consistent uh, or even to allow more efficient delivery of information to patients? So in conclusion, uh, in endometriosis, there's a trend towards clinical diagnosis, but all types of diagnosis have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, oral progestins such as Dianagest and Neta and GnRH antagonists such as Elagalix are alternatives to the CHCs and the injectable GnRH agonists. 
And perhaps there might be an opportunity for protocols and the management for endometriosis patients uh, who are shared with fertility centers. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, these are my email addresses. Our clinic website is womenspublicpainendo.com. A lot of patient information on the website, things like handouts and videos, and then our, our research website down below. Thank you. Dr. Yang, we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. The first one, is there a maximum number of months or years that a woman can take Vizan? Are there any lab tests required before starting? I don't think we really know the answer to that question. I mean, I'm just going to throw out some numbers here. I'm not even sure if my colleagues at the center would agree, but, um, you know, I think at about five years, I start to at least bring up um, in, the, in the consultation note with the, with, the, with the referring physician, maybe we should consider a BMD um, just to make sure it's okay, especially if the patient, say, might be on it for another, another five or 10 years until menopause. Also, I think it's, it's important to screen for risk factors too. Um, you know, I, I have a shared patient with a, a gynecologist at St. Paul's where, uh, who had risk factors and the BMD significantly decreased. So screening um, um, uh, for uh, risk factors, uh, I think is important too in terms of testing. Um, and um, you know, I, I, it doesn't appear that there's a major impact on uh, lipids for Diana Jess. So I, I'm not sure if, if you know, screening for that on lab tests is necessary, but for, uh, for NETA, it, it might be necessary. Um, so you know, there's a, I think there's a lack of um, a data in this area, uh, but there actually there are there is a real world study of Diana Jess with thousands of patients on what happens over 